Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement, and I'm here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we are discussing what the course has to say about goals. It's January as we're recording this. We've just celebrated the new year. And as we all know, this is traditionally a time where we think about goals and resolutions for what we hope to achieve. As spiritual students, this is a little tricky because oftentimes, we hear in the spiritual community that goals are bad, that we shouldn't be striving for anything, that we should just be. And course students will often quote the line from the course, a healed mind does not plan to make the point that having goals is anti-spiritual, but that's not the course's view at all. The course mentions goal, plan, or aim more than 700 times. And it's clear in the course that the course has goals that it wants us to achieve and goals that we can set for ourselves. So Robert, really looking forward to this conversation with you so we can just get right into it. As I mentioned, we have a difficult relationship with goals as spiritual students. We want to achieve things. We want to be successful in our lives. And yet so often the message that we hear is that there's something wrong with that. We hear and we read so often that spiritual awakening itself is not a goal or at least it shouldn't be because that implies that we are striving for something that we were we're hoping to get somewhere that there's someone else that we need to become and yet as i mentioned in the intro the course is in favor of goals so where do you want to begin with all of this yeah i mean we don't want to sort of imply that the course is in favor of goals that go after all the normal things but in its own way, the course is really goal-oriented, and we'll see that throughout the course of our conversation. Uh, the course sees the mind as inherently goal-oriented. Everything we think or do or say is because we have a certain goal in mind, without exception, according to the course. There's a great line in chapter one of the CE that says, nobody would bother even to get up and go from one place to another if he did not think he would somehow be better off. And being better off is the essence of of any goal. So from the course's standpoint, when we say spiritual awakening is not a goal, the very saying of that has a goal in mind. We wouldn't say it. We wouldn't bother to say it if there was no goal in mind. Anything we do um, in service of spiritual awakening has a goal. We we have set the goal of spiritual awakening. From the course's standpoint, and I hope that that people who maybe don't believe this now can at least consider we are just inherently goal creatures. We can't do a thing without having a goal in mind. Yeah. So with that in mind, let's just zoom out a bit and talk more broadly about why goals are important. We're goal oriented, but why should we care about goals at all? Yeah, I think we all know the answer to this, whether it's consciously or, you know, not so consciously. And that is that if you want to achieve anything, if you want to get anywhere, it's a function of how much energy you consistently put in the direction of that thing. So let's say to make it really concrete, let's say you're walking from point A to point B. Point B is your goal. If you're going to get to point B, you have to decide you want to get there. And then you have to keep walking in that direction and not just sit down or not just wander off in some other direction. So if you're going to get to B, you have to basically engage in goal-oriented behavior. And the course recognizes this. There are passages that talk about how, you know, we don't get somewhere without being constant in our efforts, directing our energies and concentrated drive in one direction. Uh, You know, we could go into a lot of passages, but the course recognizes the very practical thing that I think we all know from experience. And that is to get somewhere, you have to decide you're going to get there. That's setting a goal. 
And then you have to basically, basically put your energies into getting there. Yeah, we were talking earlier about how Jesus criticized Bill for not being goal oriented, saying that he, that Bill was uninvested in all goals. And as I was saying before, in the spiritual community, we actually think that's a good thing that feels like praise, like I'm not invested in goals. But in the course, that's not praise. That was actually criticism of Bill. That's always struck me for, for the reason that I, in a lot of ways, I feel like I, I'm like Bill. I'm not a real goal-oriented person This is overall. not true. Anyone who knows you with a Fitbit would say <laughs> the opposite. Okay. I've never we're, we're not... seen someone more chained to a goal of okay. steps per day. So I have, I have my moments. Um, but... I, I don't have it in my nature as much as I think most people. Jesus said Bill was underinvested, underinvested in all goals. I feel underinvested, not totally uninvested. Uh, I feel kind of naturally like an in the moment person. I feel like a poster child for all that is not so good about being in the moment. <laughs> um, and what do you so mean? we, well, you know, there's a way where you can be in the moment. And, and you just, you, you don't think in a long-term way. And right. then you have just a series of moments and that's it. Oh, that's so, true. And then like days turn into weeks, turn into months, turn into years. And you wonder why you haven't achieved anything that you set out to achieve. Yeah. 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 But we aren't talking about me specifically. Um, anyway, reading that about Bill really made me think, oh my gosh, being underinvested in all goals is not a positive. It's a criticism. We need to be holding goals and holding them strongly. We just need to do it in the courses way. Yeah. And the courses way is to have spiritual goals versus material goals. Cause we, we tend to associate goals with, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to have more money. I'm going to have more success in the world. I'm going to have that house. But in the course, the only goals that matter are spiritual ones. Exactly. So that's the big, big difference. When we think of goals, we think of those concrete things. When the course thinks of goals, it thinks of spiritual goals. And so the huge goal that it talks about is the goal of God. That is the goal of all goals. Uh, and it also talks about, you know, it talks about a lot of goals, but it talks about the goal of vision. The idea is that through our efforts with the course, we're trying to achieve vision. And then once we achieve vision, God takes us the rest of the way to the big goal of God. So the course is full of, of goal talk. It's just about spiritual goals, goals for the spiritual journey. Right. And that's a bit of the rub because we are really conflicted. And I know we're going to get into this later, but we're really conflicted as to how much we want those goals. So when you say the goal is God, well, the goal of having a better house just seems way more attainable and it's way more culturally applauded. You know, if you go out and you say to your friends this year, my resolution is that my goal is going to be to put God first. And yeah, I've talked about this repeatedly. I've had this whole thing in with my friend group, uh, my conventional friend group where I bring up God and everyone takes four steps backwards. And so when you say your goal is God, it's, it's harder to find that support and it's just easier to pursue material goals because they're just so much easier to attain, you know, and, and so, so tangible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of what our culture supports and our friends support, I mean, it's an insane world. So insane things get supported and sane things often don't get supported in terms of the material goals just seem more attainable. The course, there's a great lesson. It's lesson 131 in the workbook where the course flips that on its head. And let me read a, a quote from that. It says, failure is all about you while you seek for goals which cannot be achieved. 
you look for permanence in the impermanent, for love where there is none, for safety in the midst of danger, immortality within the darkness of the dream of death. So what he's really saying, if you, you know, kind of get in between the lines there, is that, okay, yeah, you can get that material thing, but the real goal is what you hope that material thing will deliver, right? You hope it will deliver permanence and love and safety and even a measure of immortality. And while you can get the material thing, you can't get the thing it's really there to deliver in your eyes. And so you're actually, when you're seeking those goals, you're seeking goals which can never be achieved. Oh, that is so good because that's, that feels really true. You know, we, we want the bigger house, for example, because we're searching for a sense of identity and safety and sense of the, home, a sense of home and belonging. The house isn't going, the house by itself isn't going to bring us that, but no. the spiritual side, the spiritual goals of love and connection that's what's and who we are as god created us that is the ultimate safety and belonging and love so we're we're wanting those things but we're going after the wrong goals to achieve them that's good right right and so what he's saying is after all that seeking and seeking and seeking and not really finding what you were looking for you feel a sense of failure that's the ego's goal right seek but don't find right yeah yeah so when the course talks about goals, you and I were discussing this earlier, it almost feels like a coach. And there's a quote that that you found, which is the meaningful seeking is consciously undertaken, consciously organized and consciously directed. The goal must be formulated clearly and kept in mind. I mean, that's what you hear at a Tony Robbins seminar, for example, if I went out and I hired a coach today, that's the kind of advice that they would give me. But it's just a sense, again, of what goals are they directing you to? And then right after that quote, it's interesting that the course gives us a goal because it says it would be very intelligent of you to set yourself the goal of really studying for this course. There can be no doubt the wisdom of this decision for any student who wants to pass it. So there's an example of where the course gives us a goal to set for ourselves the goal of really studying this course, which is very different than the kind of goals that we tend to set for ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. When you hear the course talk about the goal of God, which is a huge, huge goal that we can spend a very, very long time pursuing, or the goal of vision, you know, same thing. It can seem daunting, and yet it's clear from certain places that the course is expecting us to set smaller versions smaller goals that contribute to the big goal, that add up and get us the big goal. So for instance, in the psychotherapy supplement, we have this terrific line. A goal marks the end of a journey, not the beginning. And as each goal is reached, another can be dimly seen ahead. So what he's saying is when you really can set a goal, you're only able to set that new goal because you reached another one before it. And having reached that other one, you find a new desire in you for yet a further goal. But all of that implies that there's like strings, right, of littler goals that lead up to the big goal. I mentioned in the intro that goal itself is mentioned many times in the course. The word goal appears more than 300 times. And Mm. so when I was first a course student, I remember coming across language like, the goal of the course. And I was thinking, Ooh, there's the goal of the course. Yay. I've got it. And then you realize it says that in like every chapter, like there's all kinds of goals that the course sets. And as a student, you, you see what it's doing. It's got that string of little goals that it wants to get to the big goal. So we always say vision is the goal of the course. All the goals lead up to vision, but as you're saying, really, vision just leads to the goal of God. So there's always these little goals that bring us to the big goal. 
Yeah. And I think that when the course talks about, you know, its goal is this, its goal is that, I think those goals are not so much like little steps towards the big one. I think they are facets of the big one, different ways of talking about the big one. Yeah. Well, in this time of year, we're always talking about goals, but the goals are, it seems like there's little goals. Like I want to lose weight versus I want to really study this course. I want to master this course. I know you've, you've got a post-it note on your computer. I know I'm calling you out right now, but do you want to show me <laughs> for those who are watching, you've got a post-it note on your computer that says that, what does it say? Sorry to do this to you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> to be a master of the practice. That's a goal. You know, that's a goal that you right. can set for oneself. We, I, I have a, a goal of um, being more loving. You know, I think if you're a spiritual teacher, then your whole life should be dedicated to being more loving. I think mastering the practice is really a form of that because if you master the practice, what is the end result? But mm -hmm. to be more loving. So, so your goal is like the big one. And we can stop saying? it. <laughs> Yours is just a little goal yeah, on the way yeah. to the big one. I get yeah. it. <laughs> but we can set goals like forgiving another person. You know, these are the kinds of spiritual goals that we can set versus the typical goals that we tend to set at this time of year. Yeah, there's there's an endless variety of them depending upon where we're at in our development, what the needs are in front of us, we can set a goal of learning gratitude. We can set a goal of getting over our anger. We can set a goal of realizing that in this relationship, that person's gain is my gain. So I'm going to serve their gain. You know, the, the, the littler goals that contribute to the big one can take an infinite number of forms and still be within the parameters of it's a spiritual goal. Yeah. And I love that because when you have a, like with lesson 287, where it says, you're my goal, father, only you, it does sound very big and intimidating. And so another way to think about that is my goal is to get over my anger. My goal is to be more loving. My goal is to be the master of the practice. My goal is to study for this course. And so there are all ways of getting you to that big goal. Right. Right. Yeah. So Let's say that we set the goal, whatever it is, whatever spiritual goal that we've set for this year, what are the steps that we should take to achieve it? Yeah, well, the course has a really extensive philosophy about how to achieve goals. This is not a small topic. We did a whole weekend workshop on this 20 years ago at the Circle. I've sort of studied it off and on over the years. It really deserves a full and complete study, but I haven't done that. Um, that being said, we can say a lot about this. There's a number of things that we can say about how to achieve goals in the course. Well, you've made a list, right? I mean, we, we, we made a list. Robert had a list of 12 uh, principles of goal setting in the course or goals in the course, and we whittled it down to four much yeah. to his chagrin. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's go through them one by one. So okay. the, the first is we need to decide the goal is really worth achieving and then hold that desire for it. We need to keep the goal from eroding and not let ourselves get drawn back into old goals. So that's that's pretty wordy. Why don't you unpack that? Yeah. So what Jesus says in chapter two is the first part of it is just establishing what we really want. Okay. He says, until you have a goal that you truly consider worth achieving, you will not devote yourselves to the means by which it can be achieved. And there's a great passage in that same section that says this, the real question still remains, what do you treasure and how much do you treasure it? Once you learn to consider these two points, what do you treasure and how much do you treasure it and bring them into all your actions as the true criteria for behavior, I will have little difficulty in clarifying the means. So he's saying, before you get into the means, you've got to decide what you treasure and how much you treasure it and be like asking yourself that question all the time. And that's where we get into trouble. It's, it's how bad do you really want it? And every single year 
as spiritual students will say, oh, I really want the goal of God. I'm really going to devote myself to my spiritual practice this year. And then it's like the gym come the third week of January or even the first day of January. Right. You've, <laughs> you've broken that agreement that you had. You've broken that commitment that you made to yourself and you wouldn't break it if it were really truly valuable to you. You know, we we are committed and consistent with the things that are truly valuable to us. And so the fact that we keep breaking our spiritual ideals, our spiritual goals, says that we're not really all that committed to them in the first place. Yeah. So there's that first step of deciding this is really worth it to me to achieve. And then we have to hold it. We have to keep keep the desire for it alive and keep it from eroding, as, as you read, because what happens is, as we all know, little things in us chip away. If it's a spiritual goal, our ego is going to chip and chip and chip until there's nothing left. And then also, our ego is going to try to draw us back into the old goals and say, hey, these were great. You know, come on, go back there. Yeah. And that's where I think we need to start being really honest with ourselves because um, I'm, I'll just say, I'm always like, the goal is God. The goal is God. And then I find myself getting like triggered by this, that, or the other and holding on to that grievance. But if the goal really was God, I wouldn't be holding on to that grievance. I would just let it go because I want God yeah. more than I want that grievance. And that's just one example. But I, I think that as students, we're not really honest about the fact that we don't want the goal of God as much as we claim to. Which is we or want we would be goals. different people. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. A couple of pastors I want to draw out because he has so many choice things to say on this topic. He talks about... Um, the goal of your mind and mine, meaning Jesus's uniting and shining your ego away and releasing the strength and beauty of God into everything you think and will and do. And then he says, do not settle for anything less than this and refuse to accept anything but this as your goal. And that's the kind of mindset he wants us to have. Like, I'm not going to settle for anything less. You know, I'm, I refuse to accept anything but this as my goal. And we have to keep that mindset there because the ego is going to just try to chip away at it until, as I said, there's nothing left. Yeah. The ego tries to get in there and reinterpret our goals to its liking. Do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> Yeah, there's a place in the Holy Relationship discussions, the very first section, actually, where he talks about how the Holy Spirit, if you let him, will change the goal of your relationship radically to this whole new goal of holiness. And he says it would not be kinder to shift the, the goal more slowly because the ego would be given time to reinterpret each slow step to its liking. And I feel like that... That's kind of a general principle. If we set a new goal, the ego is going to try to get in there and reinterpret it until the new goal means nothing. It's become completely toothless and just a variation on what always was. I feel like we've done that to some extent as a spiritual community with forgiveness. So the course's goal is unconditional forgiveness and the ego gets a hold of it and says well that's dangerous you really need to protect yourself and then the goal gets reinterpreted to the ego's liking yeah until it's just another way of talking about the way you've always been right but i i just want to go back to what you were saying a minute ago about the the holding steadfast to the goal and being mm. super committed and not letting it go i mean we as you were reading that passage, I was thinking about people that I've known in my life who are really, really determined to get a goal and, and they talk about it. They wake up in the morning and they, they're just all about this goal. They embody going after this goal. And I've known people who have had that and succeeded in terms of like transforming their body, right? Like every day they get up and they eat certain things and they work out and blah, blah, blah. 
And that's what it takes to achieve that goal. What he's talking about here is that kind of conviction only towards spiritual goals. So what if we were like that person who gets up and says, you know, I'm going to eat this certain thing. I'm going to work out at this certain time. I'm going to be all about the transformation of my body, but it's all about the transformation of your mind. Yeah. And that, like, we know that's what it takes, like, say, with physical fitness or athletics, we know it takes that. But we think when it comes to the spiritual realm, there's something a bit pathological about that. We just should be sort of floating and going with the flow. And that's the essence of it all. And the course is basically saying, no, that very same mindset you would have to be an elite athlete, just transpose it to the spiritual realm. Right. Why is it that here in the world of form, we totally understand that if you want some kind of physical transformation, you have to put in the effort, but putting in the effort when it comes to spiritual transformation is viewed as a negative. That's a bad thing. That's striving. Yeah, you're, you're efforting. You heard yeah. that term? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the let's second principle of attaining goals. So you have, we need to select means that are in line with the goal means flow from the goal. And when they feel too hard, it's not because they are, but because our wanting of the goal has been shaken. Yeah. That sounds similar to what we were saying before. How, how much do you really want it? Yeah. This is like busted because we all complain that the means are too hard. Anyway, before we get there, the whole idea of selecting means that are in line with the goal is actually one of those unnoticed major course themes in the chapters in the text on holy relationships. So it's chapters 17 through 22. There's a lot of discussion of having means that are in line with the goal rather than means where there's a discrepancy between means and goal. And the idea basically is this, the Holy Spirit has set the, the goal for Helen and Bill's relationship as the goal of holiness. Okay. And what these chapters say is to get to the goal of holiness, you have to use means that are in line with the goal. Well, in fact, he says, Helen and Bill, the means they are using is judging each other, seeing sin in each other, and presumably saying, you know, you aren't doing your part in our holy relationship. That's why we aren't getting anywhere. Um, and what he says is those means are discrepant with, with, the, with the goal. We need instead the means of vision and the way to get to vision, he says this by asking, do I really wish to see my brother sinless? So rather than accusing you of sin, I've got to be asking myself, do I really want to see you sinless? That's choosing means that are in line with the goal of holiness in this case. Yeah, that's interesting because there's that famous Gandhi quote, the end is inherent in the means. And I think with Helen and Bill, you know, it's just such a good example. They want, they wanted a loving, holy relationship. Who wouldn't, right? But you can't get there by attack. You can't get right. there by judging each other. You can't get there by criticizing and blaming. And I think that is so true for all of us. You know, we want spiritual growth, for example. Well, you can't get there by choosing the ego's goals. If you want that loving, holy relationship, you can't get there by attack. And so how are we going through the process of achieving our goal? Because if we're going through it in a way that's divergent from the goal, we're not going to get there. We're not going to get the goal. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I can think of a million examples of what are that you principle. Go ahead. Well, I've just been involved in so many spiritual endeavors with other people for, you know, 40 years now. And uh, one of the ones that stands out is uh, I was living in a house with other spiritual people that we, we were all joined together. And we decided to offer a big unused room in the house as a sanctuary for our sort of larger community, which was still quite small. And so we invite everyone to get together and talk about how we would furnish it, what we put in the walls, what the, you know, like, let's create the room together. And it became an absolute nightmare because everyone had conflicting ideas of what 
you know, should go in the room, on the wall. Someone wanted no furniture, nothing whatsoever. Others wanted all kinds of great, pretty stuff in there. And it got to be a source of tremendous conflict and pain. Meanwhile, are we thinking like this way of getting there does not is not in line with the goal of having a truly sacred space? Nor is it in line with spiritual community. I mean, that's hilarious that you wanted to have this spiritual space, but everybody was angry and attacking each other about how you created that spiritual space. That doesn't make any sense. You know, at the, um, at the time it made a lot of sense. <laughs> oh, I'm sure at the time it made no sense. I'm sure at the time it made just as much sense as it makes now, which is none. Um, it's easy to get caught up in that kind of thing. Totally. Yeah. It, I was just thinking as you were talking about when I was doing mindful leadership training, I I had, I've talked about this before, but the whole big pyramid, virtues, intentions, and goals. And the idea was that you decided virtues were at the bottom, the base of the pyramid, which means they were the most important. So you figured out who it was that you wanted to be. Then you set your intentions, what it is that you wanted to achieve. And then the goal was the outcome. And what I kept coming back to was like, leave the goal alone, set it, you know, don't be rudderless. But at the same time, what's what's going to get you the goal is not just the focus on the goal, it's the means. So who you're being in any moment and how your intentions are set, what are you pointed toward? That's what's going to get you the goal. And I just remember talking so much about how backwards our society is because we focus on the goal and we think that just focusing on the goal is going to get us there. And we don't focus as much on the means because, well, you know, it's harder. Yeah. I think that's. Yeah. Though in the course, we're supposed to like focus obsessively on the goal. It's just the right goal. Like it's the spiritual goal. Yeah. But if you, you focus on the goal, like you have the goal, you set the goal, you're consistent and determined in that goal, but that alone isn't going to get you there. You, no, this you whole need the means. point is the means. Yeah. So yeah. what are you doing every day? What are those little steps that you're taking to get you to that big goal? And I yeah. think that's actually where people go wrong. So, and I'll, again, put myself in this camp, you know, you say my only goal is God. Well, if you're triggered and you're holding that grievance, then that's the little means, that's the little way that you're not getting to the big goal of God. So having the big focus on God isn't enough. No, it's not enough. Yeah. And in, in the course, we're, we're, we're doing both. And we should get to the, Third the idea that, no, we should get to the idea that, that if we find the means to be too hard, it's not because they're too hard. It's because we don't want the goal enough. And there's we'll a whole discussion of this. Yeah, there's a whole discussion of this in chapter 20 in the text, section seven. And he calls us out there. And let me just read a few a few passages from there. And we can talk about it. I feel like your goal is to get through this podcast and stay on track. He says, a purpose is attained by means. Purpose and goal are pretty much synonyms in the course. And if you want a goal, you must be willing to want the means as well. How can one be sincere and say, I want this above all else, and yet I do not want to learn the means to get it. So that's one passage. And he also says, the means are second to the goal. And when you hesitate about the means, it is because the purpose frightens you and not the means. And then finally, remember that if you think they, the means, are impossible, your wanting of the purpose has been shaken. So what we typically do is like, oh, I want God, that's all I want. I just see. And then we're like, oh, but the means are, they're just kind of too hard. And I've got other stuff I got to do. Yeah. It's, I think for, for a lot of us, it's not just that we have other things that we want to do. It's that we're threatened by that purpose. So. Well, yeah, but do we say that to ourselves? Well, it depends on how much self-awareness we have. I mean, I'm just thinking about a situation that I'm in right now where I'm hyper aware of the fact that the the purpose of God is in conflict with what's going on in, in my head. So, so 
it's devotion to another person, which we're supposed to be doing as course students. We're supposed to be loving other people. But in this case, being devoted to that person invites crazy into my life. And so I'm hyper conflicted because I don't want the crazy, but I want to be devoted to the person. And so when we have this mental schism going on, then it's it's easier to just abandon the goal of God. And I think that's what we tend to do. I think that's true, but that's, I don't think what he's talking about in these passages. What he's talking about here is such a massive phenomenon. I want to sort of you know, camp out just a little bit here. Cause what he's talking about is we're like, Oh, I want the goal. I want it so bad. I just want God. I just want enlightenment, whatever we call the goal. And then it's like, well, here's the means you're like, Oh gosh, those means are just too hard. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like the goal is, is God. And a subset of that is being devoted to this other person. And yet we're thinking that's too hard. That's going to invite something into my life that I don't want. It's way too difficult. So no. And so I think it is in line with what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. So setting aside your example, um, which I do think muddies things personally, maybe it doesn't. Um, I just think- For those who are alive, put in the chat, is this muddying things or is this clarifying things? I just think we need to face the fact that Forget about messy relationships. Let's think about the means the course has us use. It wants us to forgive. It wants us to do our practice, right? It wants us to do our workbook lesson. These are means we can sit down and do at will. And what do we say? It's too too hard. hard. And we say, but at the same time, we say, but I want the goal. I just want the goal, nothing else. We have to realize, no, these things the course is asking of us, they're not that hard right? We only experience them as hard because we find the goal threatening. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And that's where we should be honest with ourselves again, as students, when we say, for example, he's asking too much of us to practice the workbook. Like I can't go through my day every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, reminding myself of the lesson. It's just entirely too intrusive. And yet, it's just because we don't want to do it. Right, right. I mean, we've all found time that we didn't have 20 years ago in our day to just scroll, scroll. through our phones like throughout all day. We well, have time for that. What's interesting is that I think at the height, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, the height of the workbook practice is we practice every 10 minutes, right? Well, that's the most frequent. Yeah. So yeah. we statistically check our phones every 10 minutes. So we do it hundreds of times a day. And so- it And just, no one's like asking us to do that for the sake of our salvation. Right. It's that we see that as the goal. It get, it feeds us some way that doing the practice doesn't, even though it, that, like that's just illusion. We think it feeds us in a way that's, that yeah. the practice doesn't. And then we wonder why our life is the same and we haven't, haven't changed. So yeah. if we were going after the- workbook practice if we were doing our practice as as much as we check our phone we would be different and and uh we could sincerely right. say that the goal is god so the workbook asks us to do something like oh it's too hard then we do other comparable things it's comparable frequency comparable effort and we're like <laughs> TikTok's we don't not complain. that hard <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but anyway it just shows that so, so, we're not telling ourselves the truth all right so let's get to the third principle okay. unless there's okay. anything else you want to say on this one no there isn't Okay, so the third principle is I've made you uncomfortable with the the talking about the phone because <laughs> you like TikTok so much. Okay, so the, the, <laughs> the third. So we've got my Fitbit, we've got TikTok. I know. Sorry about all that. Okay, so the third principle is throughout each day, we need to pour consistent energy towards the goal. We need to keep it in mind, remind ourselves of it, prioritize times in our day when we can actively pursue it and assign it to smaller units of time throughout our day and throughout specific situations. So um, that sounds like a lot. You know, you say that to to someone, okay, you you have your goal, you have to keep it in mind, you have to remind yourself of it, you have to prioritize it, you have to carve out time in your day to go after it. And yet that's what it takes to achieve a goal. I mean, what what do Olympians do but 
devote themselves single-mindedly to their goal. And we're not all going to be Olympians, obviously, but just having that goal and having that focus throughout the day takes us way farther than we're going without it, obviously. Yeah. Well, and we just think that the rules are different in the spiritual arena. And to be honest, I mean, I know this material, and yet as we talk, I'm feeling like, oh Not gosh. a master of the practice. <laughs> no, I'm feeling like, yeah, we should all be like Olympic athletes. And I'm thinking, really? You know, it's challenging. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the, we come into our course practice, particularly in the new year, with all kinds of motivation and enthusiasm. And then when it comes down to the timer goes off and you have a choice, do you want to do your lesson or do you want to keep on doing the thing that you're doing? How often do you choose to keep on doing the thing and ignore the alarm? Well, and we've been talking, you and I, about how it shouldn't be such a choice each time. It shouldn't be like a brand new, fresh, like, will I do my practice? If we've decided to do the workbook and we've decided to do that day's lesson, haven't we kind of made that decision? Like, why is it a, a fresh choice? Like every time, like, which way will I go? Yeah. Something's not right there. When we were talking about that, I remember saying to you that one of the things I love so much about vacationing in monasteries is the the reminder of that kind of discipline. The monks don't get to choose whether to wake up at 3.30 and go to the chapel for prayers. They don't get to decide when they want to have lunch. They have lunch at the same time every day. And I, there's something threatening about that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always happy to get there and I'm always happy to leave. But there's also something really beautiful about it, too. You know, they don't have to say, do I want to say this prayer today? Nah, skip it. They just do it. It's or decided. a labora, you know, work and prayer. And I, yeah. there's something really kind of beautiful about that. Yeah. But I think on a really basic level, I mean, this this third principle is cobbled together from stuff all over the course. There's a consistent attitude there, which is you just pour energy into your goal throughout each day and in all these different ways. You know, you remind yourself, you you carve out time, you apply the goal in small ways like, okay, now this hour is about the goal and this situation is about the goal. And you know what? If you are an elite athlete, you do that. Today is about your training, which is how you get to your goal. And this run you're on, you're on is about getting to your goal. I mean, he's taking that mindset applying it in the spiritual arena, as we've been saying. And we know that's what it takes. I feel like we're in a kind of a collective denial. We all sort of reinforce each other in each other like, yeah, you know, you just kind of flow, you know, go with the flow, be in the moment. And, and that collective denial is like a blanket of sleep we've thrown over all of our heads. Part of where we go wrong is we're just so easy on ourselves. You know, we we just we say, oh, okay, I didn't do my practice today, no big deal. Um, but I know we're going to get to that. But before we do, one thing I wanted to ask you was we've been, we've been talking so far about goals in a really secular way. You know, you you devote your mind to what it is that you want to achieve, and you go after it with conviction, but. How much help do we have in this process from God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus? Mm -hmm. I mean, all throughout the course, it's talking about how how much help we have. Where does this apply to the goals that we set, the spiritual goals that we hope to achieve? Yeah, well, the course talks a lot about about how there is help. So, for instance, when two people set the goal of a holy relationship, the Holy Spirit enters their relationship, enters their minds, and makes the goal an accomplished reality on some deep level of their minds. And then that goal as an accomplished reality rises up until it, engul it engulfs them on the conscious level. So they set in motion this power by setting the goal. The Course also talks about how the goal's reality will call forth all the conditions needed for it. 
like other people playing their part in the goal. So we do set in motion this tremendous power when we set a goal, but it doesn't take away the responsibility we have to do our, our part in it. Yeah, I, I'm continually struck by how much help Jesus says he gives us personally in the course. I just did a video the other day on the the cameo, My Strength Will Support You. Um, mm -hmm. And he's there to lean on and presumably help us in the spiritual goals that we set for ourselves. The question is, how much are we asking and how much we're asking really is dependent upon how much we want it. We say this all the time when we talk about guidance, if you're not asking for guidance, it's because you don't want to relinquish any control and typically. Mm -hmm. And right. so, so we need to do a better job. I think of, of leaning on the help and the support that we have to achieve these goals, because it's not just, us centering our mind, that's a big part of it, but it's also us relying on those who have come before and the support that, um, that they can provide to us. Yeah. I mean, those who have come before, I mean, Jesus, you know, leaning right. on our elder brother. And finally, our last point here on goals is we need to not give power to obstacles to actually get in the way. Rather than being disturbed by them, we simply step away from them and immediately return to our goal. So what do you want to say and, about that? Well, that, just like the previous one, that one's cobbled together from many, many places in the course. He has this consistent attitude. So we have a certain relationship with the obstacles. You know, one relationship is the obstacles can just carry us away. And we're like, yeehaw, I'm, I'm going with this, right? Another relationship, though, is we're like, oh, you know, I got carried away again. I feel bad about that. I can't do that again. Um, and what he's saying is, you know, don't do either one of those things. Just note the obstacle, refuse to be upset by it, forgive yourself, and then immediately get back to the goal. It's like you, you, you give it enough attention to say, I need to get back to the goal. And that's all you do. You don't berate yourself. You don't feel guilty. You don't run off with the obstacle, with the distraction. Um, you just get back to the goal. And that's a way of not giving power. Like we give a lot of power to the obstacles. I think we'd rather give them power and then wrestle with them than actually just get past them and get back to the goal. And so the course has a lot of talk about dealing with the obstacles, the distractions, the detours, in this way, which I think is supremely wise. Well, do tell. Well, there are some there are some <laughs> quotes that we've got here. Um, he says, watch your mind carefully for any beliefs that hinder its, meaning the goals, accomplishment, and step away from them. Uh, another one, which is my favorite one. This is in Lesson 95 in the workbook. And this is the third day of him asking us to practice for the first five minutes of every hour. So now we've done two days at that practice. We found that it's really hard in the middle of your day to pull away for five minutes every hour. And now he deals with that whole thing. And he says, let us therefore be determined, particularly for the next week or so, to be willing to forgive ourselves for our lapses in diligence and our failures to follow the instructions for practicing the day's idea. This tolerance for weakness will enable us to overlook it rather than give it the power to delay our learning. And that's part of about four paragraphs of talking about how to deal with our missed practice periods. And the consistent message is don't, don't give up. Don't berate yourself. Just get back to your practice without delay. And that's the part that I think if we wrestle with the obstacle, we can tell ourselves we're being good. But while doing that, we're resisting, I think, the obvious course of action, which is just get back to what you're yeah. doing. I have long talked about how we like to stay stuck in the chaos and the drama 
as a way to avoid the practice and what it is that we're asked to do. And when we're stuck in that chaos, it's like, I can't do my work, but practice, look at what I have to deal with. And that becomes a way of hiding. You know, we can hide in our chaos and it's a way, the way of, of, of being avoidant. And also I think that, um, there's an, there's another way we behave like when, um, you're on a diet, for example, I think there's a lot of people who may be able to relate to this where you're like, I'm going to be good today. And then you blow it with something. And then you say, Oh, I've already blown it. So therefore I can just eat what I want for the rest of the day. And And I'll start again tomorrow. And I'll start again tomorrow. Well, then tomorrow never comes because the next day, like you kind of train yourself to blow it. Each day that happens. (laughs) Yeah. You can train yourself to blow it. And I I remember being on diets where I was just totally lying to myself. This was in college. I was totally lying to myself about how disciplined I was going to be that day. And then I would intentionally blow it just so I could, you Mm. know, eat whatever I wanted. Now we do that with our practice. I I hear a lot of Mm -hmm. students saying, Oh, I've already blown it today. So I'm just going to try again tomorrow. And there's nothing wrong with trying again tomorrow, but I just think we need more self-honesty about what we're doing. Like, are we intentionally blowing it just so that we don't have to do it? Well, those paragraphs on lesson 95 absolutely direct that they talk about regarding the day as lost because you've blown it. Mm -hmm. and and not doing that. And what he says is basically the Holy Spirit is not delayed in bringing your journey along at all when you make a mistake. He says what he is delayed by is when you use the first mistake as an excuse to keep making more mistakes. So it's not the first blowing it. It's using that as an excuse to go on blowing it. And that's what delays the Holy Spirit in bringing you along. So he knows us so well. And the consistent advice throughout the course is don't be upset. Don't regard the day as lost. Just get immediately back to, in this case, you're practicing. Yeah, it reminds me so much of how you're trained in meditation, how how I was trained in Vipassana meditation. And it was the idea of whatever thoughts come just ignore them come back come back come back and if we can have Mm. that attitude with our goals then we'd get a lot further you know we wouldn't Mm. be like oh i blew it so therefore i can just you know not do it um or not get stuck in the chaos like wrestling like we can just say okay i was in the chaos yesterday but i'm not going to be in the chaos today i blew it yesterday but i'm not going to blow it today just keep coming back I blew it an hour ago and I'm going to save the rest of the day. Yeah. That's even better. That's even yeah. better. Cause as, even as I'm saying this, I mean, you're really good at keeping us focused on workbook practice because I, I can get into the, well, you know, last couple hours are, were bad. So the day is lost and you never let us do that, which I appreciate. If we were to summarize all of the four points, cause it's, too wordy to kind of keep them all in mind. It's, it's what you're saying. It's, it's, we walk consistently towards a spiritual goal. Mm -hmm. We don't give up. We have conviction. When we go off track, we bring ourselves back and we take one step at a time until we will get there. And so in the chat, Carla's asking for a summary or, or the recap of those four mm-hmm. principles, but I think mm-hmm. that's that's the best way to think of it. You just keep stepping along the path towards the spiritual goal. Don't get distracted and stay convicted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just thinking about the four, maybe a slightly longer version would be you hold the goal in mind. You use the means that are in line with it and thereby consistently take steps towards it throughout each day. And you don't let yourself get drawn off by the mistakes, the distractions, the failures, the obstacles. You just, without upset, you just get right back on the road. And wouldn't it also be great as a spiritual community to welcome a focus on goals? And not consider goals to be 
uh, striving a step backwards or not worth talking about because they're anti-spiritual. I think that it would be great to have a focus on goals as spiritual, as long as you're focused on the right things. That's certainly the course. Yeah. Approach. yeah as long as it's the right goals. I, and I think we all can, can heal our relationship with goals, but I'm really feeling like this is a bit of a call forward this whole discussion. Yeah. Well, may it be so. Yeah. Robert, thank you for uh, another great discussion. Thanks to those who are joining us live. If you would like to join us live for these podcast discussions, we are recording now on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern and it's free to join us. You can register at community.circleofa.org and we hope to see you in a future recording. Bye for now.